All right, it is four o'clock on a Wednesday. Let's start the way we always start, by realizing, knowing, and believing uh, that we're going to get through this, and we're going to get through it together. Uh, we're going to get through this, we're going to get through this together. Now, COVID-19 has been tough. It has changed so much about our daily lives. It's upended our economy. It's required us to sacrifice. It's taken the lives of so many of our loved ones. And it has tested our mental and emotional health. It has also taught us critical lessons. That we are a compassionate people. That our ability to survive and thrive depend on each other. And that we Kentuckians are some tough people. It's also taught us a critical and deadly lesson on the importance of health care. When we fail to provide our people coverage, when we allow our population to suffer from diabetes, lung cancer, congested heart failure, this pandemic shows us that the lack of good health care options makes us more vulnerable and less resilient. In the last four years, we moved backwards on health care. The rate of uninsured children, and overall, the rate, insured, uh, the rate of uninsured Kentuckians grew. We had less options as we went forward for coverage. Here's another clear fact. We have been paying more over the last four years to get less. So today, I'm announcing that I'm, I've submitted a declaration of intent letter to CMS to transition to a state-based healthcare exchange beginning January 1, 2022. Kentucky implemented a state-based exchange known as Connect in 2013. Through Connect, approximately 500,000 newly eligible Kentuckians were enrolled in Medicaid coverage and qualified health plans. Connect was one of the most successful exchanges in the country, and because of it, we reduced are uninsured Kentuckians at the highest rate in the country for several straight years. That was the right thing. Our last governor dismantled Connect in 2017, which forced individuals to use the federal health exchange to qualify for QHP coverage. Now to support a federal exchange, a user fee is included in every individual's premium. If you sign up on the federal exchange, you as a Kentuckian pay a 3% user fee to the federal government. Last year, that fee for our Kentuckians was $9.8 million. So several states are transitioning from the federal exchange to a state-based exchange to avoid this user fee. You'll see why in a minute. Because each of them are seeing, and what we're going to see, is that we can reduce the cost of premiums to Kentuckians if we go back to a state-based exchange. We can also improve efficiencies, and we believe we're going to be able to offer more opportunities to Kentuckians. So just remember, every year Kentuckians are paying $9.8 million ultimately to the federal government because we're using their exchange. So what are the costs to going back to a state-based exchange where we control our own destiny? Well, because the code for the state base exchange wasn't eliminated, it was just basically turned off, it'll be a $5 million one-time fee to turn it back on and to upgrade it. And then ongoing costs year in and year out, as opposed to $9.8 million, one to two million at most. This saves Kentuckians, and we hope to be able to um, ultimately save in the cost of their premium uh, millions upon millions of dollars. We can save significant dollars that we can use to offset the cost of health care. Benefits of transitioning to a state-based exchange provides Kentuckians a reduction in premiums, integrates with Medicaid program offering a single door to access coverage. So this is one of the, the the incredible things that we can do to help people as they may start on Medicaid or expanded Medicaid. 
But as we want to provide job training and ultimately move people off into a better life, we can move them directly onto the exchange, potentially never having to change the doctors that they see, depending on the plans that we can sign them up for. We can provide continuity of their care, and we can eliminate disincentives where uh, some folks might not want to have to enter a whole new network. We have an opportunity to be better, to get healthier, to save money, and ultimately to provide that basic human right that is health care. It also allows us greater flexibility and autonomy than the federal exchange where we can extend the annual open enrollment period and offer special open enrollment periods. Finally offers us local control. I believe we can do this much better than the federal government. We proved that many years ago, and as we move forward, this is just going to be one part of a larger set of announcements on health care uh, that we anticipate we will be making in August or potentially even September. This letter has now been sent to the federal government, uh, and the opportunities at savings are significant. Now, as we, want out of co as we come out of COVID, we want to be better. We want to build a better economy. We want to provide better health care. We also want stronger families so that we can live our values and our obligation to protect and provide, especially for our children. Our state is number one in the United States in child abuse. Number one. As the dad of two young children, it is absolutely unacceptable, and I spent much of my time as Attorney General combating this and the untenable amounts of human trafficking, a foster care system that sometimes inflicts more trauma than it prevents on our kids. We must do better. And making real change, doing better, requires good leadership. And so, as you know, I have not announced a DCBS Department of Community-Based Services uh, Commissioner. And that's because we were waiting for the right person. Well, today, we get to announce the right person. I'm going to let Secretary Eric Freelander come up here and introduce you to uh, someone that I've known for over a decade, somebody that has um, been through the battles, has a heart of gold, and is going to do an incredible job. Eric. Today is a good day. I don't usually get good news. But today I'm happy to announce that Marta Miranda Straub will be the new commissioner of the Department for Community-Based Services. The Department for Community-Based Services is a large agency, over 4,000 employees, offices in every county in this state, and works on eligibility programs as diverse as Medicaid and SNAP and TANF and child care as well as, and what the governor was referring to, child welfare, adult protection, and child protection. This is a critical, critical group of folks who are what I call the unsung heroes of Kentucky. Marta brings 40 years of experience as a professor at EKU, uh, over the Center for Women and Families, working with domestic violence victims. She brings a wealth of experience, a tremendous knowledge of Kentucky, and a tremendous knowledge of the most vulnerable populations that we serve in the cabinet and we serve in the department, as well as the knowledge of how to address trauma, both trauma that, that we see in, across Kentucky with child abuse and neglect and the ravages of opioids, as well as then the secondary trauma for staff. So today I'm very, very happy to introduce to you all Marta Miranda Straub. Thank you. Woo! I am uh, humbled, honored, and energized to be appointed by Governor Bashir and to serve Secretary Freelander as Commissioner of the Department for Community Based Services. I have witnessed their bold leadership and commitment to the Commonwealth and could not be more proud today 
to join Team Kentucky. This is worth coming out of retirement for. Thank you. The commissioner's role is a crucial leadership position to be entrusted to oversee the welfare of Kentucky children and families at this transformational moment is a challenge that I am ready and willing to accept. With courage, humility, and gratitude, the veil has lifted and disparities and inequalities are more blatant than ever. We must address the systemic and institutional barriers that keep children, youth, adults, and families from thriving in our commonwealth. I bring an unwavering commitment to the health and well-being of staff who are entrusted to care for the most vulnerable of our citizens. They must have the resources, training, and support they need in order to serve and empower the citizens of the Commonwealth. Poverty, oppression, mental health, addiction, hunger, abuse, neglect, are ravaging our state. We know better, so we must know better, and I promise you that we will do better. Kentuckians are a proud people with a rich and long history of self-sufficiency and survival. Let's join hands and build a strong safety net together. The work before us is structural and systemic. We may not have created the historical causes of inequity and injustice, but it's up to us to fix it. Proud to serve you and proud to serve with you. Thank you. Marta's taken on a tough job, but I know she is absolutely the right person for it. Having witnessed firsthand uh, the work she did at the Center for Women and Families, I couldn't have more confidence. But I want to give her some help, and you ought to give her some help. And one of the ways that you can give Marta help coming into this job is by filling out your census. Census is going to determine a lot of federal aid and dollars that will ultimately be spent by DCBS to help children and families uh, that need our help, maybe at the most difficult moments of their life. That's what our safety net is supposed to be there for when we struggle, when you just need that little help, that hand up to where you can get back on track and moving forward in such a successful way, the census is what helps provide dollars for it. So I'd ask you to take that same compassion you have shown for our families going through COVID-19 and realize just spend two minutes, and it might in the future, over the next 10 years really, uh, help families out at a time when they need it uh, the most. Uh, before, after we've talked about the census, We've talked about the upcoming election. So the deadline has passed for ballots, uh, for, for absentee ballots, though there have been a record uh, that have been requested. Good job, everybody. Make sure you fill them out and get them in. This is the bedrock of our democracy. We need you to vote. For those that are going to be voting in person, uh, we are trying to make sure that it is safe for all the poll workers that will be helping you. So we've worked with the Secretary of State and the Board of Elections to delay our primaries to this coming Tuesday to make the process as safe as possible for both voters and the poll workers. We rescheduled the, the primaries for this Tuesday and encouraged everyone to vote absentee, but for those who didn't, we want to take every step possible to make it a safe experience. The Kentucky Board of Elections came to us and asked us to provide PPE for the elections. We announced today that we are providing them 5,000 masks, 4,000 gallons of hand sanitizer, 5,800 face shields, and 20,000 gloves. It's going to be distributed to all 120 counties because we want people to participate in elections, to participate in democracy, to make sure their voice is heard, 
on these very important days. Uh, so if you're going to vote in person, uh, please socially distance. If there is a line, please spread out uh, as much as you can. Uh, wear a mask. It's one of the things that will protect you uh, the most. New testing locations. Uh, so this week, remember, this week, if we can put up signups for, for this week, just the portal, because there are still um, spots for this week. We're in Fayette, Oldham, Jefferson, and Warren. All of those will be open tomorrow, Thursday, and then uh, two of them will be open on Friday. There are still spots available. We need people to get tested while we are having more tests coming in right now, mainly because of elective medical procedures. We need to continue to get people through um, this, this testing um, procedure, and we got to make sure we continue to test over 2% of our population every month. We have a chance to be well above that. Uh, but for next week, our new locations are going to be this is building the suspense. We've got Fayette, Jefferson, Shelby, and then I believe we're in Warren uh, for one more week. Uh, you can get online right now and sign up for next week, especially if you are in Shelby County, that being a new area uh, that we're going to be in. So, again, there's testing locations all around the state. There's no excuse now for not getting tested, and we're going to start working on plans for large groups of folks that may be going back to work soon or are back at work to try to do some more uh, widespread uh, major single event testing. All right, today's update is uh, on total number of new cases, a pretty good update. Uh, so we are, are now that we're at Wednesday, we're past kind of the, the, the slowdown we always see because labs are closed on Sunday. Uh, so today we're announcing 170 new cases of the coronavirus. We don't want 170 new cases, but when you look at Arizona, a state that is one and a half times our, our, our population, I believe, they had over 2,000 new cases yesterday. And there's only about a 20,000 difference overall in how many tests have been out there. So Kentuckians are doing a good job, but we got to remember what we see around us says it can come back very, very quickly. So again, I know it's not comfortable. Uh, the mask, some people are saying that, that, that it could reduce up to 80% of new cases in some instances. is just critically important. It's a tool that protects you, protects our reopening, and protects our seniors, protects everything that we are trying to do. I wear one, and I'd ask again that you wear one Two. Our 170 new cases, uh, 37 of them come from Jefferson, 18 from Fayette, 13 from Warren, 8 from Laurel, 7 from Jackson, 6 from Boone and Carroll, 5 from Campbell, Henderson, Kenton, Madison, 3 from Boyd, Clay, Davis, 2 from Carter, Franklin, Harrison, McCracken, Muhlenberg, Ohio, Pike, Scott, and Shelby, and one from Adair, Anderson, Bourbon, Butler, Edmondson, Fleming, Hancock, Harden, Harlan, Hopkins, Jessamine, Leslie, Letcher, Lewis, Marshall, Mason, McLean, Oldham, Owen, Perry, Simpson, Taylor, Union, Whitley, and Woodford. Now today, um, uh, our total number of tests, we're up to 329,710. I know I say it a lot, but it would be hard to envision this a couple months ago. Uh, it's going to help us to reopen as safely as we can, but we gotta keep it up. This is an increase of 5,277 tests from yesterday. Total number ever hospitalized in Kentucky, 2,455 currently. 416. Ever in the ICU, 971. Currently, 61. That's really good news. And these are reported by the hospitals. By the way, we need all the hospitals to report these. Uh, we have most of them. We need all of them. That ICU number is a very important number. It's still pretty low. It's a very good thing. And our favorite number, the total number of recovered, 
3,444. Uh, we continue, though, to, to lose people day in and, and day out. I think yesterday we, we didn't have a, a press conference, but it was, it was seven, I believe, and we lost another six uh, today. That brings our total number of individuals we've lost to COVID-19 in Kentucky to 518. It's 516 lab confirmed and, and two probable and a total number of cases of 12,995, so getting really close to 13,000. It's, it's always got to be hard to lose a, a, a loved one, and, um, and, and certainly my, my heart goes out to uh, Congressman Andy Barr, somebody I've known basically my, my whole life, um, was in my brother's class <clears throat> in high school uh, for the loss of, of his wife last night, not COVID-related. Um, I know they got young kids, they're a family a lot like, uh, like ours, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about uh, them. You know, we're, we're people, and we should be people before we're, we're Democrats or Republicans. Um, his loss, that family's loss, just like the loss of all the families uh, from COVID-19, it's devastating. So let's make sure that we continue to turn on those green lights. We ring the bells every morning at 10 a.m. It's something that's brought us together as a people, but more importantly, uh, it's something that's been there for people at that tough time. It's something real small we can all do. If it helps lift somebody up. It's well worth it. Our losses today include a 93-year-old, a 95-year-old, and an 87-year-old, uh, all women from Jefferson County. Also includes a 45-year-old woman from Jefferson County, 90-year-old woman from Fayette, and a 71-year-old man from Clay County. Uh, I believe on the 45-year-old, there are some other comorbidities. That's a pretty young age for what we have seen in, in our losses to, to COVID. But let's share a good news story. The story of Marilyn Newton from Louisville. After a 58-day stay at Baptist Hospital in Louisville, Marilyn Newton can now say she officially beat COVID-19. Although Marilyn is still on a ventilator to help her breathe, doctors are hopeful she'll be breathing on her own very soon, and she's being transitioned to Kindred Health for rehabilitation. Get this, Marilyn was asleep for 37 days during which she received plasma treatments and a five-day dose of rindesivir. Her daughter, Amber Newton, said they were told she wasn't going to make it. I got to wonder what that would be like to have your loved one, your mom, in the hospital and somebody comes out and tells you they're not going to make it. But Amber and her family have a renewed sense of faith from their experience. They are committed to helping Marilyn fully recover and to continue her fight against this virus. It's a special message from her. That's an incredible story after 58 days in the hospital. Our racial and ethnic breakdown of cases and deaths due to COVID-19 uh, on overall cases, 73.23% white, 15.15% black, 6.19% multiracial, 4.79% Asian. Ethnicity, 83.17% uh, non-Hispanic, 16.83% Hispanic. On overall deaths, on race, 79.59% white, 16.91% black, 1.86% multiracial, 1.65% Asian. Ethnicity, 95.91% non-Hispanic, 4.09% Hispanic. That number has crept up by a percentage you know, over the last uh, couple of, of weeks. Uh, again, those numbers show disparity that I think Marta was talking about. Um, things that we don't just, we, we, we we, it's not just that we should be working to change them. Uh, it's that we have a duty. Uh, I believe to me that's a, a Christian duty. It can be a moral duty. It can just be a, a, a duty that we owe to, to one another. But we certainly, after living through a 100-year pandemic, uh, 
Surely we can come together and agree that no group of our population should die at twice the rate of any other group. So let's, let's continue to remain committed uh, to fixing that. Long-term care facilities, 22 new residents tested positive, uh, 15 new staff members, one new death attributed. Again, this is an area that uh, uh, this, this virus hits really, really hard. All right, quick unemployment update, and then we will open it uh, to, to questions. And no one in state government is going to be happy until every Kentuckian has received the benefits for which they qualify. As COVID-19 restrictions are easing, we're being able to offer in-person services for those experiencing issues with their unemployment insurance benefits. So COVID-19 hasn't just caused unprecedented levels of unemployment. And while I believe they are temporary, they are historic levels. When you think about having, I think it was a 12-person staff when I came on to this job and the number of cases we're seeing now, it's quite a lift. But it's also prevented that face-to-face -face interaction that is often so necessary to help people get their claims resolved. It has been a double blow in both creating so many cases it's hard to keep up and not having one of the most important ways to address it. So during the past two days, in-person unemployment insurance services have been located near the Capitol and they've reached their capacity. I believe over the two days we're going to have helped um, at least 1,100 people directly face to face. To continue helping Kentuckians with their unemployment insurance claims, UI is going to provide in-person services here in Frankfurt tomorrow, Thursday, June 18th, and Friday, June 19th from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Cabinet for Health and Family Services Headquarters located at 275 East Main Street in Frankfurt. We are almost doubling the number of people that we've had the last two days for the next two days. Signage in the parking lot will tell people to go, but we're also going to have some priority lines. Tomorrow, there's going to be a separate and distinct line for anyone who filed in March and hasn't been helped. We want to make sure that you get through during that day, and there will be dedicated folks to help you out. And the other line will be April, May, and June. On Friday, there'll be a line for March and April, and then a line for uh, others. So the Education and Workforce Development Cabinet, working with the Labor Cabinet, is working to identify additional times and locations for in-person services. And our goal is to do a couple things. Number one, to help out as many people as we can during this time period. End of this week, early next week, helping out everybody over the phone that showed up but we weren't able to help because of capacity. But then ultimately to get uh, UI folks out in our communities across the state, whether it's moving as one large group or separating out with the ability for more people to get their claims um, uh, addressed. Again, while more unemployment benefits have been pro provided during this period than ever before, more claims have been processed. People are hurting, and I know it. And our inability to help everybody as quickly as we've needed to is unacceptable. But we're going to continue to work, and I know we were able to help a lot of people the last couple days. We'll help more. We're going to continue to improve our processes, including looking at outside vendors that may be able to come in and help us on a short-term basis uh, in uh, both uh, hopefully processing significant numbers of claims, but also going forward, we're going to have to have a new system. Uh, the, the electronic system is so old uh, that it was incredibly difficult, especially at the start when the laws changed. Uh, and, and I believe when we look back, um, not consistently updating that system, and, and you know, I know I've only been governor for six months, but so there were six months we could have updated the system, at least three before COVID. Uh, but, but it teaches us a lesson uh, that, if, that if your uh, technology is not where it should be, if you've shorted it in dollars and budgets, uh, and we have shorted that UI uh, office in, in budgets. Now, I'm not suggesting that's a legislative decision. I don't know what's been recommended, but we know we've got to do better going into the future, just like we do in public health. Shame on us if we don't learn uh, from what we've experienced. 
All right, we'll open it up to questions, and I know we have more folks than I originally had on the sheet. We have Phil Pendleton, Catherine Collins, Karen Czar, um, we have Joe uh, Ragusa, we have Daniel DeRochers, and we have Debbie Yetter. Debbie, welcome. Why don't you kick us off? Uh, so Connect was a lot bigger than just a state-based exchange. It was an entire program, and um, we, we expect that we may have more on that in the coming months. This is one piece of it, and we have to give significant notice to the federal government, uh, and here it's a, it's a couple years, uh, to get it done. Now, I like moving faster. Those who know me well say if it's a Monday, they'll get something done on Friday. I, I suggest the end of Tuesday. Uh, but uh, this, is, this gives us time to do it, to do it right, and to save significant amounts of money. I mean, it's a no-brainer if we can have um, more, uh, more options for people, if it can be uh, cheaper uh, for those individuals, and we can create a natural movement off of expanded Medicaid onto the exchange. It may even include some of the same companies to where they can transition you, at least one uh, of the... Uh, and, and it'll be more than that, of the MCOs. I also want to participate both in the federal exchange in Kentucky and in our new state exchange, and that could really be a seamless way uh, to move them. Uh, but I'm committed uh, to getting every Kentuckian signed up for some form of health care. Uh, this is just a, a start in how we're going to provide that. Joe? Uh, in regards to the Well, we knew we were going to have folks that needed help that were at the Capitol uh, and with the ability uh, to provide folks there to help them. That's something that, that we wanted to do. Uh, and it shouldn't, it, 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 it's not that it, it took a rally, it's that we've been slowly coming back to in person services. Now, most offices for driver's license aren't set up yet, uh, but we have been able to order PPE uh, for our folks. And the experience on that first day uh, was really positive. The amount of people we were able to help and to get their claims fully resolved. I don't think there's any question that having the face-to-face, -face, which is hard during COVID, I mean, it's something that we couldn't ask either the person that needs help or the person providing help to do for a while, um, certainly not before, before reopening. Uh, but the ability to get uh, a claim finally and fully resolved, I think there's a, a great benefit uh, to that in-person help. And I, I believe that based on what we've seen in the last couple of days, there's no question we've been hindered in resolving people's claims by, by what COVID has prevented us from doing, which is having those in-person uh, encounters. Let me answer one here and we'll go to, to Daniel. I recall at one point that either the governor or Dr. Stack limit, talked about limiting how many times you should go out in public each day as a way to limit your exposure to the virus or as a way to limit your exposure to other people's viral load. Is that advice still valid? Yes. Remember, every time you go out in public, every time there's a risk. There's truly a risk every time you go out in public right now. So what we have to do is manage or mitigate that risk. Now, if in a single day you go to work, and then after work you go to the gym, and then after the gym you go out to dinner, and then after dinner you go to a bar for a drink when they're open, you have just had a huge number of contacts, exponential on top of exponential. And if your kids are going to daycare or in youth sports, you know, it's even bigger on top of that. So what you need to do is reduce the contacts that you would have had before COVID by at least 50%. In other words, if you go to work with a lot of people, you probably just need to come home. If you go to work with a small number of people, you wanna go out to dinner, don't go out to dinner four nights a, a week, though we wanna support our restaurants. We, we just gotta make sure that, that we reduce that number overall. If you go out to, to, to dinner a lot, you know, maybe work out at, at home, just manage all of those together because that's going to that's going to help us manage this crisis. Daniel. If you could ask the governor any question, what would you want to ask him? Um, and one of the big questions was, why aren't these offices being open in locations where people don't have to drive four hours to get here? Because there were there are people who drove four hours yeah. twice and didn't even get to speak to somebody face to face. 
Well, the question is, why um, are, aren't these offices that what we were able to do in Frankfurt and are going to do the next couple days open in other parts of Kentucky? Uh, well, if you remember, uh, there used to be large offices for unemployment insurance all around the state. In the last administration, they significantly consolidated um, and reduced those. And then COVID hit. And where are most of those offices? They're in career development centers that aren't open right now. So the answer to that is COVID. COVID has closed down uh, significant uh, government services that we are slowly reopening, but where they would be housed haven't been reopened yet. Now we're committed to doing it. And so what you're gonna see is you're gonna see um, uh, this being brought to different areas of the state. Uh, but you now if we were able to help, which we were yesterday, over 500 people, the option to be able to do it again today is something we just had to do. We had the people here that had worked. Uh, yes, we need a, a more comprehensive, uh, better plan in all parts of the state going forward. No, people shouldn't have to drive uh, to get it done. If they did drive and they weren't able to see somebody, they ought to be helped at the very latest early next week. Uh, and we've, we've committed to making that a priority. Uh, uh, Tom Latek asked, will people be back in the Capital Education Center on Thursday? They're gonna be at, at the CHFS office at the address I read to you and because there may be some listening, and I read it too quickly. Uh, let me get, get that address again. It is 275 East Main Street in Frankfurt, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. There will be uh, more folks there uh, ready to help and ready to get things hopefully finalized. Catherine. Does that make class play a role in this health care announcement if it's delayed this announcement or if you felt the need to speed up this announcement because of it? Uh, the, the question is, has the pandemic slowed our announcement on the health care exchange? Um, yes, <laughs> this, this pandemic has slowed down everything uh, that, that I and everybody else want to do to, to, to move this state forward. It hit us hard. It had the possibility of overwhelming our, our health care uh, system, uh, like happened in New York, and you see the, the amount of loss, even per capita, that they had is astounding. Lost significantly more people than, than in 9-11. Uh, and, and not taking significant action would have resulted in significant additional uh, death. But what it also did is it took all of our attention, uh, which needs to be on a lot of things, but something that, that could have killed initial models upwards of 80,000 people, uh, takes a lot of that attention. It took so many of our people trying to get PPE on a daily basis, chasing down uh, leads. It took us uh, offering expanded Medicaid, and thank God, for expanded Medicaid. If you compare us to many other states in the South where you see a much higher death rate, I believe the reason is expanded Medicaid. If people ask the legitimate question, given uh, that we are so high in, in heart disease and lung cancer and diabetes, why our death rate isn't much higher, I believe it's expanded Medicaid. It's the fact that we cover more of our people because of that. And that's a good building block to, to moving forward. But COVID is delayed and will delay because of what it's doing to our budget. So many of the things that I wanted to accomplish as governor, but that, that's, it's not about me. I think it's so many things that would be really good for our people. I mean, our teachers and our, our school administrators and staff deserve raises. Our kids need new textbooks. There are so many areas in this state that we can do so much better with the potential, and, and, and COVID's making us pause on it. Now, I think we can come out better. I think we can come out stronger, and, but it, it's, it's delayed progress. Phil. With uh, college athletes coming back on campus, um, UK saying that we're going to have students coming back on campus as well this fall. Do you think that football games will happen? And do you think that football games can happen on college campuses with fans? So I believe uh, with uh, UK coming back and, and others, uh, I believe that we will have um, college football in the fall. Uh, pending an outbreak. You saw what happened with the NBA. It wasn't that there was COVID out there. It's that there was uh, an outbreak. Uh, whether there are fans and how many fans there can be you know, will depend on a lot of factors ranging from how bad the virus is in multiple states to what the conferences uh, decide to, to do uh, to the plan that could be provided. 
Now, what we are doing and what Ohio is doing on any large-scale event, it requires uh, a, a separate plan that is provided that we work with, and then we come to an agreement about how it will be done. So any, any large-scale event has, has required that, the State Fair being one good example. Uh, can I explain how reporting works and explain the discrepancies between local and state level numbers? We did this a long time ago. I don't know if we still have the, 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 the graph about the number of different places that we get our testing information from. It is getting better because it's becoming more automated. But we now have, oh, I'd say over 40 labs that are doing some form of testing in Kentucky. We send them the regulation about how they're supposed to report. It doesn't always mean they do. And so we continually have to remind them that they need to send first all their positives to us, but then uh, the, the number of negatives of overall tests as well. Sometimes uh, the, the providers that are doing these provide them directly to our local health departments instead, and then we get that information from the local health department. Sometimes we get it from both. But the information is written a little differently, and that's when we, we don't realize there's a duplicate, and that's how we uh, eventually uh, adjust it. For hospital beds, ICUs, that's, those are, that's data provided by the hospitals themselves. Now, that's good data because they're putting it in, but it's only as good as the person who is entering it and how often they're entering it. So there's a lot of room for error here because there are a lot of users that are out there, and they're all pouring their information in. Uh, and yes, we've seen errors on the state level. We've also seen errors on the local level because that's what they're doing uh, as well. Uh, so all these labs, all these health departments, all these providers, it's just the, the not just the volume of tests, 300,000 plus, it's the volume, if you will, of, of users or of inputs. What is the status of the stay-at-home order in Kentucky? What we have done is we have adjusted it with all of the healthy at work. Uh, and, it's, and so it's, it's, an, it's an adjusted order. All of our executive orders since uh, have either made exceptions from it or have altered it. Debbie. Yes. Uh, Arizona's numbers are high. In terms of Kentucky's yeah. remain, I think, relatively high. They've gone up and down from anywhere from 120 to 300. Are you concerned that we haven't uh, really leveled off and that the rate of positive tests is higher than um, the rate of testing? So our, our rate of positive tests when we look across the country it, overall is, is pretty low compared uh, to, to most others, which is a positive sign. Uh, I believe where we are is we are not on that two-week decline that we had. Uh, we reopened. People had more contacts, and, and we have more cases. I think it's really important to be upfront about that. And it's not just due to, to more tests. It's because there are more contacts out there. And reopening the economy, what we've what we've all agreed to do is to learn how to live with this virus until there's a vaccine in the safest way possible. Uh, I, I do believe we are still in a, we're back to say that plateau that we talked about uh, before the, uh, the two week decrease. Now, if we stay within that plateau, this is a manageable virus because that plateau is well within uh, the hospital beds, the ICUs and the ventilators that we have available. And even in Arizona, they'll say they're not just worried because of their total number of, of positive tests, which is huge. That's cause for concern everywhere. They're worried because they're at 80 plus percent of their hospital bed capacity. They're worried about ventilators too. So it's, it's really all of those numbers to, together. Joe? Um, the health insurance exchange, uh, what's, what needs to happen in order for that to actually get set up So we wanted to have it up and running at that 2022 date. Uh, and it's actually not as complicated as we think because um, while we, we talk about, you know, in our vernacular, the, the last administration tearing down Connect, what really happened is they deactivated the code, but it's still there of, of, that, of that database and, and how we use it. So what we've got to do is we've got to reactivate it and upgrade it because it's, it's a little old and look at unemployment. If we don't upgrade... Um, our databases and our platforms, you can see what will happen. That's a one-time cost. We think of about $5 million. That's half of what we pay the federal government every single year 
and it's a one-time cost. And we've got a lot we're going to want to do around health care. We believe this is one of the almost the, the easier steps. Uh, and our goal is to make sure that we don't have a, a benefine debacle uh, ever in this administration uh, when it comes to those signups. And I want to make sure that when people go, when we're back to that, they can sign up for the exchange, they can sign up for Medicaid, they can get the additional benefits that they can be connected to. I mean, the one positive thing when people were working towards benefined is you could go to one place and you could get multiple benefits. That's a good thing, but it's got to work. has said that they've had trouble talking, they haven't been able to talk to a human being. Why is it so hard to get them to be able to talk to a human being? And three months into this, why haven't more um, people been elevated to that tier three status where they can deal with these cases from that perspective because those appear to be the most helpful? So tier, tier three status takes a lot of training. Uh, it takes a federal background check, as my understanding, which, which takes time. And the reason more people haven't been called uh, is that we have you know, a limited number of staff and what almost a million uh, overall claims, but but our communication's not been good. It's not been, uh, and that doesn't mean that the people there aren't working hard, uh, but but it, it's not been it's not been where it should be. Uh, these are our citizens. These are uh, my people. Uh, we should have done better, and and I'll take that blame. I don't want to put that on on the the unemployment office. But my hope is this, plus some other steps that we are taking. Uh, can start getting real results. If we can just get caught up, we'll still have a lot to do uh, moving forward. Uh, but we've, we've got to get people caught up. Catherine. Can you talk about about 1,100 people have been helped in the past two days. Do you know the amount of people that have had to be turned away over those two days? I don't have an exact number which we can get. I think it was a couple hundred uh, today. I think we got the word out before it, it got that much. Uh, larger now, all of their information um, was was gathered. So we didn't we didn't just turn people away. They went through in a, in a drive-through line once we got it organized, with the ability to give all of their information. And our commitment is we have a priority of contacting them, but not just somebody calling them by a real adjudicator, unless their claims have already been processed. So today, we had a group over in the lieutenant governor's office processing those claims, and many of them got resolved today. Now, they'll get a call, not from a, a, what we call a tier three person, because their claim's been approved. They'll get a call from somebody you know, saying um, everything has been resolved. Others, I want to make sure they're called by that adjudicator, that they don't have to have you know, an extra conversation unless it's to schedule a time to talk with them directly. So our goal is, even if there wasn't, we didn't want somebody waiting in line for eight hours and not to get help. I mean that's just that's that's even worse uh, than getting than getting than than being told that that we'll contact you. But this, it's a priority. It's gonna happen. It will get called, and if they don't, I'll fix it. But they're gonna get called. Bill. You mentioned getting some outside help kind of deployment. Mm -hmm. Is that still being researched, or what can you tell us about that might involve? Uh, there there are different groups out there that I know are helping other states. Um, we're gonna be communicating with them, seeing what their capabilities are. If there's a way to bring in extra and outside help to get us caught up, I'll do it in a minute. And all I want to do is to, to help our folks, and, and you know, I'm, I'm willing to consider any option that gets them the help as quickly as possible. Karen. How many people are currently working to process claims? Overall? Overall. Uh, I need to get that number for you. I know that um, today uh, we had, and just in that one center, 14 tomorrow. I think we're going to be closer to, to 30. Um, but that's not the overall uh, number. And there are different types of claims. And so it breaks down. There are some claims uh, that, that don't require us the highest level of adjudication. And so there's a whole group of people that can do those. And then there's middle level claims. And there's a different group that can do those. And then the highest level is, I mean, it, it, this is a system that's like speaking Greek. And it shouldn't be that difficult, but, but I, I always joke that um, they write so many things in Latin for law school so that you actually have to go to law school and everybody else can't do it. I mean, it's, it's even seeing a printout. If I said, I want to know for these 60 people that, that somebody provided me um, what the holdup is, I mean, you need somebody to decipher uh, what, they, what they send to you. So it's, it's very complicated, and, it's, and, and we're still limited by the federal government. 
And some folks need to know that everybody's not going to qualify. A whole lot of people qualify based on the changes we made. That was another reason that we're facing what we faced. We expanded it faster than just about everybody. I wouldn't take that back, even though it's caused some, some, some delays. Uh, COVID kept us from helping people face to face and an unprecedented number of claims. And, and we are where we are, but that, it doesn't there. I'm not sure anybody's faced all that at the same time, but uh, my, my job is to make excuses is to get things done. Um, we should have done better um, by now. Um, we're looking at every option to make sure we're doing better going forward and we'll get you all of those numbers. All right, so we will have um, a briefing tomorrow and then we'll be off again until Monday. Uh, but folks, our ability to, to reopen, our ability to rebuild the economy, the ability to do things like open pools and have youth sports all depend on us following the rules as well as we can. And I will admit, it seems like some folks out there are, are tired of the rules. I, I get it. Cabin fever is pretty strong, uh, too. But we don't want to fall backwards. Arizona, they may have to pause their economy. Their governor's saying they're not. I, I don't know him. Uh, but with what they're seeing, could you imagine if we had to do that again? None of us want to do that. And we're going to have to live with this virus until there's a vaccine. I hope it's soon. But that takes us changing the way we do things. And that's what this life has thrown at all of us. None of us expected it. You know, I thought I knew a lot of what the job of, of governor was until a one in every hundred year worldwide pandemic came our way. We need everybody to be willing to continue to do things differently, to cut down on those contacts. It helps us take care of our fellow human being. I'm really excited about the announcement of Marta Miranda. I think that we're going to do a great job uh, helping especially our children and our families in need. I'm excited about the steps we're taking in health care. And this isn't uh, political. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what president did what and where. If it helps cover more people, it's a good thing. And we would have talked about unemployment in political terms before all this. Remember when, when there was critique and it ended up becoming a partisan thing about too many people being able to sign up for, for unemployment. You know, this is shown if you tear all of it back, you get rid of all the BS, and we're people. And at our most critical times, we need to make sure uh, that we as government can provide the help that's, that's needed. So let's try to move forward and be in there for each other. Now let's try to remember that the divisiveness, even though there's an election this November, uh, only sets us back Let's continue to, to do the right things as Team Kentucky. Thank you all very much.